we will be talking about um, the main part of what will be Carnot maps, which are an even easier way of generating kind of a Boolean equation and thus a circuit out of a truth table. So it's all about designing a digital circuit to do what you want it to do. Um, before we talk about them, I'll make a brief introduction to what we call gray codes. Um, so where gray codes come from, are we can imagine we have designed a system, and there's a counter here, and say it's counting down, um, and we have it set up so that when the counter is equal to certain values, it does different things. So, I don't know, maybe if you had a space shuttle launch when counter is three, you know, it does something to the engine, starts the engines, um, and when counter is zero, there's full liftoff, so it breaks away some braces. I don't know, I'm just making it up. But the point is that we have this system, so there's a counter and it's acting upon the value of the count. So when this is happening, you can imagine, okay, this should work because it's going down, and when it gets to, say, three, then this becomes active, and when it gets to zero, this becomes active. But when you look at the count, the problem we'll run into, I'll show here, is that, for example, jumping from this state to this state, um, you notice all four bits are actually changing. And when these bits change, they won't change perfectly because it's a real system. They won't all change exactly at the same time. Um, so, for example, here I have bit one. 0, 0, 0, um, and we go along in time. So because of differences in delay, different parts of the chips are at slightly different temperatures, there'll be this intermediate zone here um, where one line has changed and the others have not quite yet changed, and then they all change. So at this point here, it's fine, and at this point, it's the expected value. But there's this glitch here, effectively, where it's not. It's actually equal to 0, 0, 0, 0. So what will happen in a real system is that um, going from this state to this state, it might trigger one of the other counters we don't intend to. So in this example I have it, it's triggering the 0, 0, 0 state here. Um, or likewise, it could trigger a different state because maybe this line switches first before the other one. The point is, because so many bits are changing, um, there's some ambiguity here in what, what will change first and what will happen. So with gray codes, we design them to instead change a single, a single bit at a time. So this is a gray code counting sequence, for example. Um, and these are used in quite a few fields. You run into them in communications and um, other coding. They're originally actually designed for a mechanical shaft encoder so that only a single output bit would change its time. Um, again, to avoid the problem shown where when you have multiple bits changing, there'll be some intermediate values that can be wrong, especially if you're just trying to do a comparison. Um, so here in a gray code sequence, you see only one bit changes at a time. So in binary, we see it goes from equivalent to decimal zero to decimal one, um, but then it's jumping, it would seem, to what we would call a decimal three. But this is because only a single bit can change at a time. Um, so it's not the same as the normal binary counting sequence we know. Um, so to use Carnot maps, we will be, you'll need to know how to generate these gray code sequences, or you should have an idea. And I'll show you how we generate them. And to do this, we start with the simplest possible gray code sequence. And this is going a one bit gray code. So this is one bit here. So it starts at zero, a single bit changes, and it goes to one. Um, so the next step is that we, we can, well, we can write, I'll write it out again here, zero, one. Um, and then we mirror it downward. So by this I mean you can draw a line here, 
and then you rate the mirror image of it, so one, zero. So now I've mirrored it. Um, and then I can rewrite that again. Zero, one, one, zero. And the top part, I add a single zero in front of. And the bottom part, where I've mirrored it, I add a single one in front of all the mirrored versions. And this becomes the two-bit gray code sequence. Um, to generate the three-bit gray code sequence, we just do the same thing. So I'll rewrite this, 0, 0, 0, 1. And we can see how only a single bit is changing. And then we mirror it. So 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. 0, 0. And again, we do the same thing. So I write zeros in front of the top here and ones in the bottom. Um, and this becomes the three bit gray code sequence. And you, again, you can see still how only a single bit is changing between each successive line. And if we wrap around, so we go from the top up to the bottom, it's still only a single bit changing. So as the counter wraps around. Um, and the 4-bit is unsurprisingly the same sequence. Um, so that'll generate the counter code showed on the previous page. And I mirror it, 100, 101, 111, 110, 010, 011. 0, 1, 0, 0, 0. And again, you just add a 0 to the top part and add a 1 to the bottom, and that's the 4-bit. And you can obviously just keep going to generate any length you need. Um, we'll only ever really be needing up to 4 bits, so that's as far as we'll see, but the process to generate it's the same if you um, do need larger sequences. And we'll also use these gray codes again later, uh, talking about state machines. They're good for the same reason that a single bit's changing. So when you move between states, only a, um, there's no, there is no intermediate steps possible. So again, when we want to move exclusively from doing task A to task B to task C, etc., you can use gray codes because based on that number, you have some outputs. Based on the next number, some outputs. So as the number increments, the outputs are always in the state you're expecting. And that's the same thing. So where we see gray codes is um, when we move on to Carnot map. So, so far we've had, we've showed truth table forms of a sort of a design. So we have some inputs, we have an output. From that, we showed how we can generate the sum of products form um, to directly write an equation from the truth table. So in the sum of products form, we looked at each min term associated with the input and said the output is the addition of each min term. Because at each of those locations, uh, each of these min terms is one only for this specific truth table entry. So we can fill this in in another way. And we have what's called a Carnot map. So in the Carnot map, we have the A, B variables mapped up here. So these are inputs A, inputs B, and the C variable mapped here. Um, so A, B, you can see 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. So here is where we're using the gray code counting um, when we write the variable down. And that is to say only a single bit is changing. So to fill in this table, we basically go to the truth table. So ABC000 zero, 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 um, is 0. We actually are only going to write the 1s just to keep it cleaner. Um, so you can just skip ahead to 0, 1, 1 is a 1. So at this point, um, 1, 0, 0 is a 1. So when C is 1, basically the entire time, um, A is 1 in the rest of them, you can say the output's 1. So A is 1 here, A is 1 here, A is 1 here, 
and the one extra one is this point. A is zero, B and C are both one. Um, so down here. Let's just, oops, yeah, so there's the same thing. So I've just redrawn that exact same map, so it's larger here. Um, so where this becomes valuable is that each of these locations, which were a position on the truth table, can also be thought of to represent one of the sum of products terms. Um, oops. Computer's crashing here. So each of these spots represents the same sort of sum of products terms that we had showed before. So I'll just have to pick PowerPoint. Um, so there we go. So that, here's the, that map written down again. Sorry about that. So each of these um, boxes represents one of the literal. So for example, we had showed before that 0, 0, 0 can be thought of to be A complement and B complement and C complement. And in a similar way, you could fill out for the rest of them. Um, so what we can directly see from the map is that, for example, for these four ones, if we write down the product term here, um, for example, we have A and B and C complement, A and B complement and C complement, A and B complement and C, a and B and C. Um, so when we look at this group of four ones, you can actually see that the commonality between all of them is simply that A is one. Um, so only the A term is there. The rest of them all differ. Um, so while A is constant, B takes the value of here. We just have B. Here we have B complement, so meaning B is zero. <coughs> or B is 1. Um, here we have the value C is 0, or C is 1. Um, so what we can actually say is that this group can just be represented by the single term A. In a similar way, um, we can look at an adjacent group here of two bits. So if we group these together, we have the term ABC, and if we write down, say, what is the term here? It's A complement and B and C. So the commonality in that group is B and C. So this group is just represented by B and C. Um, so from this, we can actually then just write out a simplified equation. So we can say F equals A plus B and C. Um, and it's okay, these two overlap, it doesn't matter. And we need, when we do this though, we have to, we have to have minimums of two, um, or ideally a minimum of two literals, two or more, two, four, eight, sixteen, etc. Um, you can have single ones, but it's a little more wasteful, because if I had just written a, if I had just circled this, for example, then it would become F equals um, a plus A complement and B and C, which isn't the simplest form we showed before because we actually did the same example and it ended up to A plus B and C. Um, so to use the K-map, all you do is you write down the location of all the ones and you try to make groups of um, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, etc. ones just like that. And you want the groups to be as large as possible. So in this example, I made this group two, even though it could be one. Um, making the groups as large as possible results in the simplest possible logic. You can't include um, like three or any odd numbers like that. It has to be two, four, one, two, four, eight within the groups. 
So you can write down, just for reference, this is all of the three input product of, chum, of sum terms um, written down in both with the truth table zero and ones as well as the product of sum terms themselves. In the exact same way, we can use four inputs. Um, and to do four inputs, we just have two inputs along the top, two inputs along the bottom. And again, we get um, the gray cooking. So 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. So the point being that each adjacent square differs by only, you can see it here as a single 1 on the input, or you can see it this way as it differs by only a single variable. Um, so here to here, for example, we go from B to B complement. Um, here to here, we go from B complement to B. From there to there, we go from D complement to D, and everything else stays the same. So it's the fact that when you move between adjacent squares, only a, a single variable changes that lets us do this simplification. Um, so, when I had said before with the gray codes that you have to remember even between when the code wrapped around you noticed it differed by a single bit. So, one thing to consider is that the top, bottom, and sides connect. So, if you have a chart like this, um, you can imagine wrapping it around so that the left and right sides connect. So, here, for example, you can make a group like that. So that's saying that it wraps around the side. In a similar way, the top and bottoms connect. Um, so if I have this chart here, you can make sort of a cylinder so the top and bottoms connect. So again, we can form a simplified term here. Um, and if you write out the terms, for example, this term here, you could say is um, A and B complements and C and D, and this term is A complement and B complement and C and D. Um, so obviously the commonality here is the last part, B complement and C and D. So then this whole term will become B complement and C and D. And when you're doing this, you can either you can write it out like this if it's more comfortable. Um, you have the reference of the map with all of them written out. Or you can just look at the variables. So in this case, you could say um, what the value of the variables, what is staying the same when I move from here to here. So you can see, for example, there's a 0 here, a 0 here, and obviously a 1, 1 stays the same. So it's just the A that's changing. Um, so the final term won't have A in it because A differs. In a similar way for this one, when you look at it, obviously A and B are going to stay the same um, because it's in this same column. So we look at C and D. One of them will change, and you can see it's C changes. Um, so thus, if you write out this literal, it'll just be whatever is needed to create a 1 from this. So in this case, we could say, it's A complement and B and D complement. So that's this. So then this example would be F equals A complement and B and D complement plus A, oops, not A, and B complement and C and D. So the two, the two terms I created. Um, so that's another example of using using them. So you have to remember again with these sideways connections, when you look at something like this, um, you can do better than, for example, you might just say, okay, well, I've got two there, two there, two there, two there. Uh, but that's not the simplest possible form because, again, due to the top and bottom, um, Mappings, we can in fact simply go like that. And we have a group of four. And then we have a group of four here. So you need all ones to be encompassed within one of these groupings. They can be encompassed by more, it doesn't matter, but it has to be somewhere. 
And again, it's best if you can make, encompass it within the largest possible group. Um, so for example, here, you could have done that, and then you could have, you might have said, well, I'll just do two here and one here. Um, but again, that won't be the largest possible grouping. So you'll want to do it in that form. Um, and if we go through this example, you can say, okay, what will, what is the resulting equation here? So we have two literals, again, because these two connect. One here, two here. Um, so for this one, you can look and say um, A is changing from 0 to 1 in this column, uh, and B is the same, so I'll have B complement, it's 0, and I have C is the same, and D changes, so then I'll just have B and D, or B and C, sorry. Because C is 1 in um, all of the cases. B and C. Um, for this literal here, for number 2, we have A is 0 in both of these, so A complement. And C and D, um, here we can see D is 0 in both of them, so A and D complement. So that's how we do k-maps in that example. So again, you always want to consider the top and bottom. Um, yeah, there we go. And of course, you can, because of this mapping, um, in this example here, the corners, the corners don't connect diagonally, so you, you can't just make a group of two like that, for example. Um, but if we have all four, we can make a group of four, because this connects here, as well as connecting here, as well as connecting here. Um, so th in this example, it's actually only a single literal is encompassing that entire truth table. Uh, so we have, for example, D is 0 here, so D complement um, ended with, what changes, B complement. I believe, because A goes from 0 to 1 here. Um, so in that case, this is what the results would look like. And again, yeah, so this was just to show that you can't, you can't do stuff like that. Um, so these are wrong examples. Uh, you can't go on diagonals. And you need groups of 1, 2, 4, 8, and so forth, 16. Um, so powers of 2. So you can't do a group like that. Um, anything else is basically OK. So those are the rules written out. And again, you can get the slides online if you want them. So. You need the groups of 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and you always want to maximize how many terms you get within one group. Um, again, remember the top and bottom connects. And there may be multiple solutions to the exact same problem. Um, so for example, say I had a map like this. Um, that group there, I can't put 6 in a group, but I could either put 4 here um, well, four there, or four there, um, or you could put four potentially in two. Again, you want to maximize it. Let's say, or say I had something, uh, let me erase that one. Um, or if you had something like that. Um, there's going to be a few different ways of doing it. So you have your choice, for example, you may have two there, four there, and again, in this case, you'll want to maximize this one, so add all of those together. Um, 
And I had a better example somewhere, but in some cases, for example, you may have a choice of which four you put because you're always going to be left with two. Um, just be aware of that if you're comparing with other people that it's possible to have right answers. Where, sorry? Like here? Uh, because you can't, it has to be 248 or 1248. Okay. You can't have 6. Um, so it always has to be a power of 2 within each group. Uh, and the 32 and stuff, when we talk about more than 4 inputs, that will come into play. But Yeah, so it's critical you remember that you need the groups as large as possible, but within that constraint. Um, so to go through a full design example, we'll use what we call a vote taker as one, one example. So here, say we're given the problem, we have, we have to create this truth table. So this truth table is such that the output is one as long as two or more inputs are one. Um, so we would use this, for example, if we only take an action if two or more of the inputs are calling for that action to be taken. And such uh, redundancy you'll often see in things like spacecraft or aircraft, where you have multiple systems that will compare their answer, and only if a number of the systems agree is the action taken to avoid a single failure from causing some sort of catastrophe. Um, so in this example, oops, sorry. In this example, I have the truth table copied out here. So what we know is that basically if there's two or more ones, there's a one somewhere. So for example, here, 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 and here there's zero. And we often won't draw the zeros just to avoid having this other um, stuff on the slide when you're making groups. So in this example, then the simplest group is just that. And there's a second group there. And that's basically the answer. So from this, you can draw out what is the commonality between all these terms. And you can say in this term, it's A, um, because in all cases, A is 1. B differs. B is 0 and 1. And C is 0 and 1. So this means that the results, that group only depends on A being 1. So you can say it's A. And for this one, you can see A is 0 here and 1 here. Um, C is, and C is only 1, and B is 1. Um, so this group is only created when B is 1 and C is 1, which we can also see from the min terms I've written here. B and C are common here. So this um, actually ends up as that previous example before. It's A and a or B and C. So again, we can see this is way easier than when we went through this example using all of the logic identities. It took a lot of work because you had to substitute different things in and try different things. This way, you get a very simple representation um, with a fairly minimal amount of work. If you have more than one output, um, that's fine. And what you do is you split it into two problems. So we'll make k maps for each of these outputs. So the sum output will have one, and the carry output will have another k map. So I'll take the truth table, and again, this is from when we showed the truth table for the full adder. And I'll copy both of them down like this. So if I go through it, I say, where is the first one? So there's a one when carry n is one, and a and b are zero. So C in is 1, and A and B is 0. There's a 1 when A, B is 0. Um, a, B is 0, 1. So A, B is 0, 1, and carry in is 1. There's a 1 when A, B is 1, 0. Carry in is 0. And there's a 1 when all of them are 1, so 1, 1, 1. Um, so that's the map for the sum output, I believe. Yes, so the sum output. 
So what you notice from this is there's no groupings you can do. It's just not possible. Um, so all we're left with is groups of one. And th in this case, the result is just as bad as if you did it um, using the sum of products form because there's no way to simplify it. And that's fine. That's just how it ends up being. For the carry output, we'll do the same thing. So we have, for example, um, carry out is one, a, b, in this case, this case, this case, this case. Um, so a, b is zero, one, carry in is one, one, zero, one, zero, one, one, one. Um, so the carry output gives us something that looks like this. Again, you can't do groupings of three. It has to be um, powers of two. So we're forced to do a grouping like this, which results in slightly simpler than if we had taken just the um, sum of products form, as the sum of products would have four terms. And here we'll have three, so one and I don't think I could copy them. So if you want to do this, you can say, for example, for number one, C varies, so it's going to be based just on A and B. Um, for number two here, C is always one, so it's going to be C and, and we notice A is always one, C and A. And finally, for number three here, we have, again, C, it's only um, applicable when C is one because it falls entirely within this column. And we're going to have it when B is one, so C and B. So then you can say the carryout is equal to A and B, or it was C and A, or it was C and B. Um, and if you want to do the same thing for this, it is, this unfortunately will just give you the same as what you'd expect from the min terms based on the truth table. So the min term for here is invert A and invert B and C in, um, invert A and B and C in invert. plus A and B invert and C in invert, and this final one, A and B and C in. So that's, based on the K-max, the simplest possible representation for the full adder. So how do people feel? Does it make sense, basically, how these are working? Um, and there'll be, I'll give you some other examples, basically, you can do if you don't feel super confident on them. Okay, so the next example... Um, that I'll do <coughs> will be a comparator. So this is something we, for example, haven't seen before. And this is a four input example. So how the comparator is working is I've split A and B is into two inputs. And I consider A and B one binary number, um, number one, say, and C and D a second number, number two. The output is one only if A and B is greater than C and D. So we can see, for example, here, um, A and B is binary one, or decimal one, C and D is decimal zero, so the output's one. Um, if they're the same, zero, the output zero, and anywhere else it's higher. So if A and B is decimal three, C and D is decimal two, the output's one. So it's comparing two numbers that are input to A and B and C and D. So we could imagine the block like this. Number one, number 
two, and then out. So it's saying, is number one greater than number two? So that's sort of a realistic example for something you might see. And um, if we do the k-map, what we can see is we have a and b here, and we have c and d zero. So we just put a one anywhere a and b um, is greater than c and d. So for example, here we have the input three, so it's greater here, here, here. Um, here we have the input two is greater here, here. Here we have the input one is only greater in this case, um, and everywhere else gives us zero. So when we go to map it, um, you can see the best possible representation is that we'll be forced to use four here. Um, we can use two here. And unfortunately in this group, because we have three, we have to use a maximum of two because that's the closest power of two we can use. Um, so again, we have three terms here. I'll call them, or four, sorry. No, three, yeah. One, two, three. Um, so the first term, we can say C is always zero, we notice. Um, so it'll be composed of C complement. And D varies, D is zero and one. And A is always one. So C and A. Um, the second term here, we can say A and B are always 1, and C varies, but D is always 0, so A and D complement. And the final term here, um, we know because it falls in this row, C and D are 0, um, or yeah, C and D are 0, so the result will be we'll need C complement and with D complement. And looking between the two remaining cases, we say that B is always one. So then we end it with B. So then the output of our comparator um, just becomes, if we write all the terms out, again using a sum or or to combine them, Um, that's the resulting comparator. So this function is comparing A and B and giving you an output one only when it's greater than C and D. No, so this is it. This is, based on the K-map, the simplest possible representation of it. Um, so I believe that it shouldn't get simpler, even if you try to use Boolean. Yeah, you get the simplest. So basically, when you're specifically asked to use Boolean algebra, write it out, um, you should. But this is otherwise the easiest way. And you can use this type of thing to check your answers if you want, because it's quite quick to do. And um, I'll show you an even So you can use programs to check the K-map sort of map stuff. So if you want to do examples, it's a good way to do it, because it's really fast um, to get a minimal representation. One other thing you'll run into is what's called don't care states. Um, these are, say I have this design here, and there's certain inputs that either the input will never happen, um, or when that input happens, I don't really care what the result is. Um, so we'll show it, I'll show it in the class with question marks and that means that it just doesn't matter. Well, it could be, or it could be one. And this is where the advantage comes in, is that when you, um, when you draw it out, there may be simplifications that happen. So for example, if I draw this one, I don't actually know if for sure. So if I have a one, when B and C are one here, when A, is one, C is one, and B are one. Um, and then there's a few don't care states. So there's a don't care state here, and there's a don't care state when B alone. Um, so when I draw the don't cares, and what I notice is that if I assume there's zero, 
I won't have a great representation because I'll be forced to take three individual terms. Um, whoever wanted me to design this set, it just doesn't matter. So what this means is that you actually assign them a state of one. So I'm going to say, okay, you don't care. I'm going to assign it a state of one, so you'll record that. Um, and then you get an even simpler representation. So because I've assigned it a state of one, I can then make a term of four here and a term of two here. Um, so we use the don't care states in the k-maps. And again, that's why the another reason the k-maps are kind of really good is that it's very easy to insert those in and just see where it makes the best difference. So sometimes it's better if they're zero. Um, sometimes it's better if they're one. So you just put them in and adjust them as needed and then record most of the time you'll be asked to record what should what have you chosen as the don't cares. Um, a note on the notation of the don't cares is that here I'm using question marks to say I don't care. You'll frequently see X is used as well. So in the truth table you might see um, X to mean don't care. We the simulation tools we'll be using, they use X to mean another meaning, which is that it doesn't know what the logic state is. Um, the difference being that if you do something like, if you have a circuit, say like this, um, and you try to simulate this, it may give you a don't know um, because what you've asked it to do is say if there's a one here you're driving it um, one zero one one here zero one it's then driving a one and a zero into the same point and so it doesn't physically um, there's no real it's a conflict so it'll say I don't know and give you an X in the results um, or if you failed to connect certain things, so if you're simulating stuff, and depending on the gates, if you just leave one input, you forget to connect it to anything, so this one's connected to one and this one's just disconnected, it may give you an X. So that'll mean when you're simulating, don't know. Um, for the most part, I'll try to use question mark as don't care and X as don't know, as in invalid. Um, but that's not universal whatsoever. A lot of people, especially older logic documents, use X to mean don't care. So um, what you will see, for example, is you may see a truth table like this. In data sheets, say it's A, B, C. Um, So say C is some control input, if it's zero, um, the output is some defined state. If this input is one, it just doesn't matter what the others is. So they'll use X's to mean don't care. So you can have any input on A and B, as long as C is one, the output is you know some defined value, say zero. And that's something you will frequently see. So in a similar way, what we were doing was sum of product mapping. We can do the product of sum mapping. Um, so in sum of product, what I was doing is I was looking for where are the ones and where can I put the ones in the k-map. In product of sum, instead of sum of product, what I'm going to be doing is looking where are the zeros. Um, and this is exactly before when we were talking about using max terms instead of min terms. Um, exact same system. So you look where the zeros are and you mark the zeros in the truth table. And why you might ever want to have two systems to do what seems to be the same thing and like a total waste of time is that in some truth tables you'll have more ones than zeros. So for example, um, to do this with the previous mapping, there's a number of ones you have to make groups for. If you just use the zeros, there's just two zeros you write down and that's it. Um, so if you're dealing with a larger thing and you have a number of outputs, there's an advantage of just having a smaller number of literals to work into groups. So for example, 000, 
R to zero here. Um, oops. Actually, so this example, sum of products is what we were doing before. So just as a comparison, um, I'm using here. So when C is one, I put a one here. Um, zero, one, and zero, if there's a one. Zero, one, and one, there's one. One, zero, and one, there's one. And one. Um, so that was using the sum of products. So you write down all the ones, and then we group a bunch of them together, and then we'd have maybe a group of four here, which is fine. Um, but using product of sums will should give you the exact same results at the end of the day. Um, written a little differently, but for all you care, it's the same. So in this case, I'll put a zero. So A, B, and C are all zero. There's zero, and there's just one other zero, where one, zero, zero. Um, and we look at that and we say, okay, I'll just make a single term there. Um, and again, because it's a product of sum, what we have here is we need to uh, figure out how to make a zero based on these inputs. So then we have A plus B plus C um, is equal to this point here and this point here is complement uh, complement A plus B plus C. Um, and again, these are sort of from the min terms, max terms, so these would be the max terms, as we would call them. And you see again that the only commonality is just B plus C. Um, so if we had a few terms, we would combine them with an AND. In this case, we don't. So the end result is just F equals... Um, you may have to simplify it a bit. I mean, we can see. So in this case... Uh, yeah, you should because, and actually, so what you'll get here is that B is 1. Um, so this just turns down to 1 because A changes and C changes. In this term, um, it's only when C is 1. So this entire term ends up to C. So then you do, you, uh, yeah, there you get the same result. So you should, right, which makes sense. You may... In this case, because there's only sort of the one result, it directly works out. You may have to expand it a bit because when it's written, you know, it'll be, in general, um, you'll have some form like, you know, B plus, in this case, you'll have something like B times C um, plus A times D, say something like that. Whereas in the product of sums, you'll have, you know, A plus D, and these won't be the same. Um, so when you first write it out, it might not be the same, but if you expand it out, it should be exactly the same results. Um, so typically, if you have only a few zeros, as in there's lots of ones, the product of some term will be faster. And the final thing to discuss, and this is where um, the idea of wanting to minimize the number of terms to think about, is that we have we can use these maps for even something like a five input variable. I won't actually be using this much in class because it can get crazy very fast. And what you do here is that we actually have two four input maps. One map exists where the fifth variable e is zero. Another map exists where the fifth variable e is one. And when you are looking for common terms, these two are actually superimposed over each other. So it's almost, you can think of it sort of like a 3D deal. So this is one of them, and the other one is directly superimposed on it. So this point here is actually um, connected to that point there, and it differs only by the variable E. So if you have, for example, 1, 1, um, there, you can make a literal of two by just connecting um, this box to this box. 
Likewise, if you had, say, 1, 1 here, um, 1, 1, 1 there, and 1, 1, 1 here, um, you have an option of actually connecting these two and these two to make a literal of size 4 because they're over top of each other. So you can imagine with this type of mapping, if you're dealing with five inputs, it could make a huge difference using product of sum or sum of products. Because if you can reduce um, the number of terms you have to think about, you're basically less likely to make mistakes um, because there's less number of times you have to think, well, how do all these connect? And it is, people can even use these for higher levels, like six and and it's possible, but you would almost never do it manually. It's You've lost, the whole appeal of them is they're simple and fast. So if you're trying to figure out 3D or ND mappings, um, it's no longer simple and fast. And if you are doing these yourself or you want more practice because you're not too comfortable with it, there's a good program you can download totally free. And you can put in a truth table, it'll generate the K-map, and it'll show you product of sum or sum of product and highlight the literal. So, for example, um, I think I have it open here somewhere. Yes. So you can select how many input variables you want, and it can do a huge number of them because it does this sort of um, mapping itself. So if we have a five input you can see it's sort of generated two separate maps here that it will be superimposing. Um, so if you have a three input, for example, you can just oops, put in wherever the ones are. Um, let's put another one in. And it populates the K map for you. And then you can either do sum of products or products of sum. You hit solve. And then there you go. So it's using a slightly different notation where it's showing A, um, where is this? Yeah. So the A complement and B complemented, you can see, is represented with the line in front of it. So you have to get used to that. But when you click on this term, it's highlighting. So it's saying there's one grouping, there's another grouping, and there's another grouping. Um, so it's showing you what each of the groupings it's found are. Again, this might not give you a different answer because sometimes there's different ways of selecting the groupings. Um, and if you do product of sum, in the exact same way, it'll show you um, what are the groupings. So in this case, there's only a single grouping there and a single grouping there. So in this example, we can see how the sum of products and products of sum, as it's written them out, so just the equation here, do differ, but if you expand everything, um, you should end up with the same result. So that's a really good um, method of checking your answers. So for the assignments and stuff, obviously you're expected to have shown where they came from, but feel free before you hand it in to check that. Um, or, as I say, if you want to go through a number of other examples, it's a good way because you can just make up something, do it yourself, um, and check that you got the right answer. So, a quick review of today. Um, we talked about the idea of gray codes, where gray codes are a code that differ between increments by only a single bit. And this is useful because it avoids this problem of intermediate steps, where when a binary code is counting, there's going to be some physical differences that mean that at some point in time, um, going from one state to another here, that there's an intermediate state, an undesired state. And if you're not careful, you may act on that undesired state because you think the counter has reached zero, for example. Gray codes differ by only a single bit between each state, and this includes um, yeah, only a single bit between each state. So you can generate gray codes. I think the example there wasn't a full gray code, by the way. So uh, You can generate gray codes by starting with the most simple form of a gray code, which is a one-bit gray code, um, and then mirroring it. 
So you mirror it, and then you add ones to the part you mirrored in front and add zeros to the original part. And then this results in a 2-bit gray code. You then use the 2-bit gray code. Um, and again, this goes right here. And we do the same process. So we have the 2-bit gray code. We mirror everything. Um, and then we add 1s in the bottom part and zeros in the top part. And this is the 3-bit gray code. You can take the 3-bit gray code, mirror it, and get the 4-bit gray code. So the gray code will always differ just by a single bit between each sequence. We'll use the gray code um, because it forms a good way of um, rewriting the truth table, basically. So we'll rewrite the truth table in a K-map um, where we'll write either two variables along the top and either one or two variables down, depending if it's a three or four input k-map we have. Um, and in this case here I've shown a, a three input. Potentially you could do it with just two inputs. I mean so for a two input you would just have c of always, you wouldn't have c. Um, but it really becomes useful for these higher levels of inputs. So we write along the top and the side here um, in gray code the inputs and then we fill in where the ones are in that resulting k-map. Because uh, the k-map differs by a single bit, this means for example that I can group together, let's say if I group these four bits together. When you look at this, what it means is that going from here to here only one bit has changed, and you can see the B bit has changed. Um, so within this group of four bits, you can see that um, A is always one, so in this case A is one, in this case A is one, in this case A is one, in this case A is one. But B uh, differs, so B is one, then B is zero. And likewise C differs, C is zero, C is one. So what we know is that this group um, can be represented by the case of only the A variable. It, we only, it only depends on A because for all of those ones, B is zero in some cases, B is one in others, and C is zero, C is one. Um, so it's only A it's based on. For something like this, you can do the same thing, except you say it's based on C being one because C is always one. Um, and here we can say A is 0, A is 1, so it's not based on A, but it is based on B being 1. Um, and then we just use, if we're using uh, sum of products forms, we just have F equals A plus C and B, or A or C and B. And that just directly gets us the minimized version. So from that, you can just synthesize it, and you're done. Four input product of sum, exact same idea. Again, each move between a column or a row varies by a single bit. Um, remember that this single bit change does uh, hold if we go across the boundaries, either horizontally or vertically. So horizontally, you can see, for example, we go from 1, 0 to 0, 0, so only a single bit's changed. Same thing vertically. Um, so this means that we can form groups across these bounds like that, so right of the side, of the top or bottom. Um, and you always want the groups to be as big as possible, as long as the group is 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, etc. Um, in it. So because of that, we can do either four corners. Um, and remembering you can't go on diagonal, so you can't go like this to the corners, you can't go across, and you couldn't join three. Um, those are all wrong. And that's sort of how we go through it. So what I was talking about was a sum of product. Um, so if we have only a few ones, the sum of product is really handy because you know you only write down a few ones here. If you have tons of ones, like maybe there's only one zero in the truth table, the rest are ones, you might want to use the product of sum. Um, and the product of sum form is just where we write the zeros down 
and then form the groups with the zeros. Here, um, instead of using the min terms, we're basically using the max terms. And max terms are using or. Because it's, again, you can remember product of sum. Um, so this part has to be an or. So again, you just look at, to get this zero here, what is the required or term to get this group to always be zero? So for example, here, I have um, C will always be zero. So I know I'll have C plus um, A varies, so A is not involved, and B is always zero, C plus B. So that term is equal to C plus B, or B plus C, whichever way you want to write it. Um, and the result gives us the zeros. When we're doing sum of products, remember we're trying to get ones, not zeros. So when you look at the term, you have to go, what equation would create all these ones in the correct spot? So for example, here I have B is one, everywhere there's a one in this group. Um, therefore, the equation is just B, because if I just were to draw B on the truth table, so if I had F equals B, um, I could say, okay, draw one wherever B is one, which would be that, which would be the group, oops, that I, the group that I was trying to create. So there's a number of examples we went through, um, and they'll all be in the slides. So for example, the vote taker, and this is what we were showing before. The full ladder, again, we can show how this is a lot quicker than trying to go through all of the, using all the logic identities. Um, the final. Um, so you just have two separate outputs now. Yeah, because they, it doesn't necessarily depend on each other. So when we use the K-maps, um, we just write, you know, F equals, so some output is equal to this, carry output's equal to that. You have two separate equations. Effectively, you can write two completely separate logic circuits. There may be, when you go to synthesize it, there may be some areas that are common. Um, so let's see if there's an example. So when you when you actually were to draw it, for example, I have A and B here, um, and here I have A and B and C N. So physically, when you're creating the circuit, let me just get the blank page here. Oh, well, crash! I don't know that. When you're creating the circuit, at some point you'll have an AND gate with A N and B N. And the output of that is A and B. So you can AND that with C in to get A and B and C in. And then use that in one part of your circuit and use A and B in another part of your circuit. Um, we're just going to ignore that. Yeah, so that's, I mean, and that's basically what we'll be using the K-map. So again, when you're doing this, um, I do recommend if you if you want to play around a bit, you can just use this sort of um, you can use this program that's free, and you can just put in any inputs you want. So you can just make up a question, see if you get it right, and then you're happy. And if, as always, there's more information in the books. Um, that Bebop to the Boolean Boogie, Chapter 10, basically goes through this entire thing. And the uh, notes have some of these and additional examples if you're not comfortable with it. Any questions?